Hello, I am Dr. Leslie Werpsa. I am the co-owner of Rampart Professional Solutions. We are an academic editing and coaching services that catalyzes the research and writing success of scholars across levels. Today, we are going to talk about four different approaches to qualitative research. These are narrative, phenomenology, ethnography, and case studies. Two things, however, before we delve into the intricacies of these methods that we need to consider are, um, what, what do you need to think about before you choose your method? Uh, if, we, if we look at this as a roadmap, we need to think about your destination first and foremost. Where do you want to go? What do you want to understand through your study? What do you want to know? It is related to your research question, which is the subject of another video, but what do you want to learn? Your method is very much, the approach and the method that you choose is very much related to that part of it. What is the purpose of your study? Do you want to document, for example, cross levels of analysis processes of institutional change, of uh, integrating a certain program or a curriculum? Do you want to know and talk to different actors involved in a certain situation? Or are you interested in what kind of qualities over a lifetime make an effective leader in your field? Well, the first is probably a case study. The second lends itself more to narrative. So you see where I'm going. Think first what you want to learn. And then look at your roadmap. Um, the second thing that's very important when we're talking about choosing an approach is, is it doable? Um, can you have access to your participants? If you need to have access to certain archives, perhaps on medicine in Germany at a certain time, can you actually get there or get access to those archives online? You need to think about that. What is doable? What is practical? That also involves a time frame for your study. What can you do um, to get your PhD? Because the best dissertation is a done dissertation. The best article is a, an article that actually gets written and submitted. All right, let's move into our uh, approaches, our four approaches to qualitative research. First of all, we are going to go back to narrative, which I mentioned before, our life stories. They document what happens to individuals, how they are shaped over time, it has to do with how their identity was formed. The main unit of analysis or data collection process that happens with narrative, it involves uh, usually in-depth interviews, and those can be one very long one, etc. Uh, methods, uh, that detailed method we'll discuss later. But basically what happens is that the participant describes the events that he or she lived in what are often known as life course stages, and then they reflect, first and foremost, about how they make meaning, how they interpret those experiences in shaping who they are. They identify turning points in their lives. And then what happens is you collect, it's usually one, two, three to five, very small sample here, very small amount of participants. But um, you retell those stories. It's often uh, in the delivery of the data, it's chronological. But the researcher contextualizes that and helps pull out themes that are seen through transcripts of those person's life stages. As Polkinghorne summarized, narratives uh, bring very deep insights into how a very small number of people order and create meaning from their life events. And again, they're going to be, there is a sampling here that's similar life events. I'm going to choose, you want to understand X, your destination. Uh, narratives affirm that knowledge is valuable and significant, even if it's derived from a small group of people and even one person. A very profound oral history or autobiography, or, a, or I'm sorry, a biography, for example. Um, narratives, however, aren't always just based on interview techniques. It t people tell you about their whole life story. Um, I have actually an example of a, one of my professors from my undergraduate uh, studies at Kalamazoo College. There was a murder-suicide that occurred in one of the dormitories, and she 
got access to the, it was a man, a uh, young man who killed a young woman. They were in a relationship. And um, my professor got access to all of the text messages that they exchanged over a period of time. Uh, so she nested a narrative within a case study, actually, but, but it was brilliant. Uh, she did a profound feminist analysis based because they weren't available, obviously, because they were dead for interviewing. So she looked at their texts, what led up to that explosion that created that event. So be open-minded about possibilities for uh, sources of data and narrative. Now we're going to move on to phenomenology. If narrative is very individually based over time, people's life histories, phenomenology looks at a specific, a purposive group of people who share a common experience, and it looks at how they interpret that common experience. They might interpret it differently, but the key here is that they share that common experience. Um, again, I said, you know, narratives are small, very small sample. Uh, phenomenology moves into 6 to 11, everywhere from 3 to 18 I've seen, and uh, methodological uh, suggestions for what that proposal sample would be. I have a student right now, a client right now, I'm sorry, who is, um, she's working on uh, the topic of how do women who are MD, PhD, very high level, high advancement, how do they negotiate breaking through uh, barriers to them becoming leaders in academic medicine? So they're sharing the same experience. They're actually in the same institution. You can go cross institution for phenomenology. It's fine. But um, they're sharing the same experience of trying to break through the barriers and walls and what things are supporting them in their life balance and uh, are they being mentored, et cetera. So, so their shared experience is their MD, PhD is involved in leadership tracks. That's their phenomenon. All right. So um, phenomenology is more bounded in a time frame than um, narrative. So it would be, again, in this case that I'm using it as an example, it would be when they were hired, what happened since they were hired, etc. cetera. Uh, this approach can look at similarities and differences as well. It's the, it's the what people have in common or how does it contrast in an experienced uh, phenomenon. And phenomenology involves... Uh, very concrete in detailed coding techniques. Interviews are transcribed. You start with looking at sentences, meaning units, or salient statements, and then you go to bigger meaning units. All of these approaches, actually, that we're discussing today do involve uh, very uh, concrete and detailed analysis, uh, but phenomenology particularly has a very specific way of doing that to get at that shared essence of the experiences. And then those individual experiences are compared um, with the others, the other group of six or 11 or whatever we're talking about. Um, bracketing one's experiences always is important uh, in all of our methods, but phenomenology, very, very important to be curious, to be surprised. As we're looking at all these qualitative approaches, we discussed in the previous video that we all come with a world of view or preconceptions, our ideas about what we should be hearing. That's very important to be conscious of those, that constant reflexivity as you go out to choose a method, ask your questions and collect data. Important to keep that in mind. The next method is ethnography. Um, if narrative is very individual, life story based, uh, phenomenology is these people have shared this same experience in a bounded time period. Ethnography is looking at culture. It's almost like taking the individual and looking at a culture as it holistically. Uh, culture doesn't necessarily have to be that you go to New Zealand and study the Maori and their practices in medicine. It could be something, for example, of hospice patients. They come together and um, in a significance, they have cultural patterns within their group. Uh, they have shared beliefs, rituals, customs, things that evolve when people come together in a shared experience. So it's bringing it to a larger group level even than phenomenology. 
transplant, you're looking at the patterns that are inscribed in that group. It does require a level of immersion, lots of participant observation, individuals getting to know the group. And some of the things that come up with ethnography are that, are you an insider? Are you, are you actually experiencing uh, what that group is experiencing at the same time? Or are you the outsider that's going to have to gain trust with that group to have them let you know what goes on? What are the inner daily workings of their group or their culture? So ethnography, there's, there's some issues that come up. Who gets to study who? Same things we discussed in the last video on positionality. Um, there's a lot of debate that is going on around this constantly. Uh, but it gets into a very deep, rich experience of group dynamics, cultural dynamics. So uh, you can give more references later on the insider-outsider uh, debates. So one thing we uh, may observe right now is research gets more complicated the closer you need to be to your participants. Now we're going to go into our next uh, approach, which is case studies, which is a bit more distance, although it incorporates elements of all of the three that we've talked about. Case studies, uh, if you think about narrative going ultra deep, case studies are, let me get at the big picture, almost like an eagle eye, and an eagle goes from the big picture and then has to get very concrete when it attacks its prey, right? So case studies are kind of like that eagle eye, from the overview down to the very concrete. The beauty of case studies is that they incorporate multiple actors involved in a situation or a phenomenon or an implementation of a strategy. So it's that cross-sectional uh, character of case studies, which is really exciting. Um, again, like I said before, multiple actors, they're usually descriptive. Uh, how did this happen? What went down? Who was involved? Where did decision making take place? That is the sort of holistic nature of case studies. Um, like I said, it could be if you're implementing a policy, you'd talk to the student and you'd talk to the dean of perhaps an academic medical setting. Uh, what's really important if you're going to approach a case study as a researcher is to think about your skill set. They usually, triangulation is very important in case studies, multiple sources of data, so archives, participant observation, in-depth interviews. They bring all those uh, data collection methods together, case studies do. So uh, that's really exciting, but just think that that perhaps is what you need to at least be open to acquiring skills in those areas. So. We've talked about narrative, life stories, basically, experiences over time, identity, phenomenology, commonalities in a group, a purposive sample, ethnography, takes the group a bit big to a different level, bigger level, uh, culture, community, and case studies, the iterative, interactive analyses. As you choose uh, your studies and you move forward in choosing your methods, your research question is going to be very important. It will direct you. And that is the next uh, topic of our next video. Thank you very much.